It's just about 3.30 in the morning on uh, July 3rd, yeah, it's uh, Sunday, July 3rd, uh, yeah, 13, it's, you know, <laughs> it's 3 hours and 30 minutes into the day of uh, Sunday, July 3rd, yeah, Friday was July 1st, uh, Saturday was July 2nd, and so Sunday, today is July 3rd, and it's, uh, three hours and 30 minutes into that day, this day. I'm not actually coming out to do the uh, vlog out here because I just finished. I had something to eat, I had some watermelon. Sit over here about an hour listening to some old music. Some old uh, J-pop actually. And uh, now I'm going inside. <laughs> so the battery is almost dead so I've got to recharge the battery. But today was was, was, a, was a rather interesting walk. We talked a little bit about the history of uh, uh, socialism. We're going to go a little bit further into that uh, over the next coming days. Uh, and show you where things kind of sit in terms of uh, how, you, you know, if you're following the election and stuff like that. See how the election actually sits within history. So... Uh, I thought that would be a few minutes to <laughs> say hello, but uh, uh, the day is over. Uh, I'm going to go in and do about a half hour more work, go to bed, because uh, at uh, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm getting up to go to church again. So, <laughs> no continuous sleep. I'll, I'll, I'll catch up on my sleep on Monday. So, anyways, I will see you then. Well, hello, everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the... <laughs> Next segment of uh, Big Bang Theory Hell's BTS vlog. Yeah, that's right. It is uh, 23 hours and 22 minutes into the day of uh, Monday, July 4th, 2016. And I almost uh, had one day of not vlogging. Uh, that's because uh, I spent most of Sunday and Monday sleeping. I thought I was going to do more than I did, but... Uh, after I went to bed, I finally ended up falling asleep around 5.30 on Sunday morning. Uh, and then when I, I got up to go to church, uh, I couldn't open my eyes properly. That happens sometimes. Sometimes if, I'm do, if I do a lot of reading, uh, my eyes get bruised. And uh, just around here, around the eyelids here, around here like that, you get sort of... Uh, uh, it was worse before. You, you, you initially see a puffy. Now you see a puffiness, and a some degree of bruising. There's a, there's a reddish tinge, reddish bluish tinge to it. Uh, before it was actually worse. It was uh, you could actually see uh, the black bruises under my eyes. Now you don't see the black bruises under my eyes the way you did before. Now you just see to see the puffiness. There's some redness to the eyes. Uh, the eyelids, eyelids, and below uh, hurt to touch. They they they're they're tender and sore. Uh, that's what happened on Sunday. So I didn't end up going to church. I ended up just simply going back to bed and uh, uh, resting. Uh, but that's but that's all you can do when you have to close your eyes. There's there's not much else you can do. So uh, resting is kind of the key. Is where you end up going. Oh, but anyway, I've I've got, and this is this is where we'll talk about my efficiency mode uh, in terms of getting work done. This is where it comes in. It comes in in that um, 
when you're doing this type of work and you do have these fatigues, you, the work doesn't stop necessarily. And you, it's during these down periods, this is sort of what determines your efficiency model. It's how much you can get work done on a very easy scale, even though you're supposed to be laid up and it's sort of the work, is, the work you're doing is probably easy. It's strenuous and broken up into bits and chunks. And how much of a project you can get done often determines that if your efficiency, your efficiency is good or not. Uh, and what's happening now is that even on my down days, my efficiency is good. It's, it's picking up. It's, I'm getting work done that needs to get done. And so I do have progress even on the down days. So that's a, in terms of my efficiency model, that's a success. Um, so what's going on with what the product? Most of the projects now are still just cleaning. They're, 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 it's, I did that move in, in uh, the uh, January time frame. Uh, that was a massive move. I did a lot of, not even moving. Uh, I didn't move to a new place. I just uh, completely reorganized my place, did some renovations. Uh, and then there was a backlog after that. And the backlog really took me a long time to sort of get everything done. It, I'm just now emerging from that backlog. So, and I've sat down, I've, 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 I'm starting to connect all the different parts of the Institute together. All the different parts of the, uh, all the different Institutes are coming together now too as well. And so the pieces of the puzzle, the pieces that I've had been working on, uh, are all starting to come together, and I'm starting to see uh, something that's more cohesive. Uh, I've spun off some shows into uh, other uh, areas. Uh, some things worked and some things didn't work, and so there were adjustments there. Uh, for example, Tweetline Plus. Tweetline Plus is more likely than not going to be moving toward towards a longer vlog, more type of an insta vlog type of thing, and uh, it will continue rather than being simply uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 to twelve minutes, which I find rather short. Uh, I think I'm gonna it's gonna be uh, about, a, about a half hour, twenty minutes to a half hour in length. It really depends on how much I actually have to say in order to complete the thought. And this is it. It's about completing the thought. Sometimes, there, sometimes there's not a lot to say, and sometimes there's a lot to say. And so I went back down, looked at my notes, reorganized my notes a little bit better, and realized that, that there had to be sort of an in-between the tweet line plus and uh, something more uh, aggressive like uh, headlines and beyond. So we haven't even gotten back to headlines and beyond yet, but we're still working on that, uh, the ad hoc notes there. We're looking at, at the development of the ad hoc notes into something more significant, like an insta vlog, which is about a half hour in length, and brings the notes more together. So, um, that, that, you know, that, that this is this is the nature of research. The nature of research is you you start off something, you try it out, and you keep tweaking it until you get it right, or just where you think it's going to be right. But even when you get it right, when you think you got it right, and say, okay, this is good, even afterwards, after you, after it's a part of the re a regular part of the schedule. Uh, you still keep tweaking it because there's still things that need to be done, things that need to be fixed up, things that can be said better, things that can be adjusted better. Uh, in other words, there's always something more to push for. So uh, that's kind of uh, uh, the way I sort of take things here now. Uh, but uh, yeah, we had a <laughs> we had a rather in-depth conversation uh, on a peripatetics, and so uh, I think we're going to continue that. We're going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, uh, the history of socialism, and because the, these these things are important, the history. Of, I mean, I, I look at, on the internet. You go look at the comments. You you, you look at people's discussions on socialism and their ideas of uh, free thinking. And a lot of these people have no idea of their own history, and you try to point it out to them, and they just completely they they, they don't want to see it, and that's because the history of socialism is not a nice history. It it as a matter of fact, the history of socialism actually contradicts. A large chunk of what these people think socialism is. In other words, most of the views on socialism is complete fantasy. There's no fundamental reality to it. There's no uh, functionality to it. And so a lot of people get lost 
uh, in the ideas that of the so-called intellectualism, without necessarily looking at the concepts themselves and asking, okay, is there a history here? And if there is a history here, how does this history meet out? How does how does what does it look like? Is it what intellectuals say it is that that, that this is a way to improve society? Is this the type of social engineering for from so, from the socialist standpoint has it has it been successful? Is it going to be successful? Because you look at your history to determine determine whether or not you're on the right track or not. And if your history says and shows demonstrates that, that social engineering from the socialist standpoint doesn't work, I mean it's left and it hasn't. It's led to millions of deaths. I mean. Auschwitz and the Holocaust was a consequence of socialist social engineering. It was socialism on the right, but now most of the socialism on the right has kind of gone and hidden, and the left seems to have taken over the entire uh, the socialist spectrum. So, uh, even though the socialist spectrum is supposed to be left and right, the left has sort of uh, become, have, has taken the uh, word socialism for itself and now socialists are fundamentally on the left. They include liberalism, humanism, um, secularism. There's a whole bunch of isms in there. That uh, hedonism uh, that stem from this socialist stream. And there's a history there to it. And it doesn't matter whether... And I was talking before about... I mentioned about uh, Paul Pot. But again, I can guarantee you that most people that I'm, when I'm talking to you out there... Uh, are not is not going to know who Pol Pot was. He's not around anymore. He was a leader. He was a leader of the Khmer Rouge. This was in Cambo Cambodia. Uh, go look up the killing fields, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. And uh, Pol Pot, under his regime, he thought himself. He thought it was a democracy. He was there to determine to repair the 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 the, 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 the damages of society caused by peasants. He said the science knew better. And he went in there and tried to change everything. And he did it by force. He took over everything, like a dictator, like just like Stalin did, just like uh, Hitler did. Uh, he took over and he created this uh, massive state. Well, millions of people died. I mean, to, to the point where they just simply left their bones in these fields. And what you saw uh, were basically pictures of fields with bones, and they called them killing fields. And all there was, beach, uh, there, there were sun bleached bones in rice paddies. Now, because you need to consider this, that you see paddy after paddy filled with bleached bones. And then how many millions of people must have died to create these piles of bleached bones? And you understand the horrors of socialism. Most of these horrors are they're removed from sight, so nobody ever sees them. And this, this is this is not a particular good thing. I mean, and this is what I'm saying is you've got to look into history. You've got to see what's going on. And the thing is, if you look at, at the history, you look at the history of socialism. And this is why I talk about Dostoevsky because he was there. He was there. He, he was part of this whole socialist movement. He was there at the beginning. If you read his writings, you don't. I'm talking, about, and I don't quote. And I said before, I don't quote, because you need to read the entire writings. You need to see his his view of things, and in and in doing seeing his view of things and understanding his his view, you need to do an author study. Then that means the author study means you need to uh, read all his works and read as much information as you can about us, who he was, what type of person was he, how does he think. And you have to do a little bit of psychology in there because you know that the, if the person is writing from experience, that even if it's, sometimes it's fictional, that the person is actually writing from experience, you can now begin to understand, okay, from the writing, you, you can start doing a sort of a psychological pro profile and sort of say, okay, well, who is this person? Where, do you, where did he get his information from? How did he experience this information? Uh, and then is there a transformation in his life? Is there a transformation in his literature? What was that transformation? And these are sort of the questions you need to ask. You need you need you need to get in there and sort of uh, really start asking these questions. Uh, you know, as you read, as you start, and that's what I'm saying. It's, it, it, this isn't something that takes you 
uh, <laughs> a couple hours. This is a couple months worth of work. But this is what research is. Re real research takes you beyond your standard knowledge. And because you're beyond your knowledge, the understanding takes time to develop. And it, 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 the, the initial work will take you a couple of months, but it, it could actually take you up to a year to really fully digest and understand everything you've read. read uh, everything you've, you, you've read. I mean, I know for myself is that, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll work on a project. I'll be done two, three months doing that. The main part of the, re the main chunk of the research will be done in two, three months. But six months later, uh, I go back to it because I realized I began to realize and understand something that I really hadn't understood before. It t and, it, and it took that time, the six months plus, so to sort of sink in, to sort of uh, become part of my personality, become part of my uh, uh, my overall experience. To begin to say, okay, ah, I understand this now. And when I say about understand this, I'm talking about in in the terms of the quantum mechanics terms. The quantum when when a quantum physicist says, "I understand," it's not absolute. It means your understanding is to a specific point, but there's also, also all that point beyond that point. There's more to go, and there's more beyond that point. That's you know, so it's not an absolute. I understand. And this is sort of, again something that uh, many researchers has many researchers have to get used to, is that there's not an authority out there. There is no uh, authorized knowledge. There is no authorized truth. Uh, there is always more to know. There's always more to understand. And because you never achieve the absolute, you never have the ability to say, "Ah, I know absolutely." And anyways, I think I'm going to leave it here for now. Uh, I'm outside on uh, my uh, the Kauai Tea House patio. So, uh, having fun with that. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you more probably uh, tomorrow night. Uh, we'll be out here again and we'll see. I don't know. Uh, so far, 37 minutes. We got to tw now we're at 21 minutes. So, I think we've got 17 minutes. Maybe I'll come back a little in a little bit and we'll talk a little bit more because uh, if we're at 17 minutes, I do another 10 minutes, maybe more, uh, on this discussion, and uh, we'll end the episode here, and uh, that will be it for the night, and that way we'll be able to get this out to the uh, editing bay. So, anyways, uh, I think that's uh, it for now. Uh, when we come, when I I'll think about more about this whole socialism bit, and we'll sort of bring it further into the history of socialism, and some of the implications for what's going on today, particularly with the uh, election in the United States uh, between Donald Trump and so far Hillary Clinton. Uh, I know Bernie Sanders is there, is there in the background, but uh, uh, right now the media seems to be focusing on uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and there's some sort of uh, some interesting. Interesting uh, events that uh, and discussions to be had in that area in respect to the history of socialism. Uh, I'll see you then. Alrighty, welcome back. It is time for our next segment and final segment of uh, Big Bang Theory's BTS vlog uh, for this episode. Anyways, yeah, it is just about one hour into the day of. Uh, Tuesday, June 5th, no, July 5th, uh, 2016. Uh, there we go, almost missing, almost messing up the day. Uh, I should the month, actually. Uh, so, let's see, in the, next, in the next seven minutes or so, uh, we can wrap up and talk uh, and get in a good, uh, sort of an overview of uh, the history of socialism. Uh, obviously, socialism comes out of the out of Europe, the European sphere. The first 1600 years, uh, from basically 1000 A.D. up to just about 600 A.D., is primarily Italian and uh, and Spanish. It belongs to the papacy. Uh, but by the 1600, things start to fall off. Uh, things don't go well for the Spanish, and in in steps uh, the new Protestant uh, uh, expansion of things uh, into the 1700s where you have um, basically uh, the United States coming to America 
uh, well, the, not the, the English coming to America and uh, beginning its uh, sort of expansion on out. So as the uh, Spanish Empire collapses and the Italian Empire collapses, uh, the English rise. And the French are kind of caught there someplace in the middle there. Uh, they do have a renaissance. So they, 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 they have a Spanish... The first two renaissances are not French. The first, the first renaissance is Italian, then Spanish. And then after that you have uh, uh, basically what we call an English Enlightenment. There's not really a French one. Uh, French kind of comes up a bit, but it disappears rather quickly. So, you, you know, the French come up in the 1700s. By the time the French come up in the 1700s, uh, the breakthroughs that the uh, the British had made in their uh, fleet, in the naval fleets, uh, meant uh, that uh, Admiral Nelson uh, was able to sort of defeat the French and really sort of uh, produce a dominance, uh, a British dominance over the seas. And this is kind of where America got its navy from, as, as, uh, as uh, Britain colonized uh, North America. Uh, in sort of the same fashion that the Spanish had done South America and the uh, Caribbean islands, uh, you 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 sort of had this sort of growth from, uh, on the English side of things, and this kind of it sort of gives you an idea of where things are are are, are going here because what you see is uh, instead of executing its uh, its sort of uh, we call them riffraff. There are up and coming religions in uh, England that England wants to get rid of. And the, namely, one of these are namely the Puritans. So they send them over to become the pilgrims. They become the pioneers in uh, North America. And this is where you have uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is not an American holiday in the sense that it's from the United States as much as it is a British holiday. It's the, it's the landing of the pilgrims who were English. They were uh, Empire loyalists. They were. Uh, part of the British colony. This was the beginning of the American colonies, and this is the colonial period of the United States. Well, the colonial period of the United States doesn't really last too long. It gets to about uh, 1776, and by 1776, this is the beginning of the American uh, Revolution. This is the American Revolution here, 1776, and now you have something different. It's still fundamentally English. It's still fundamentally British, but now it has a different bent to it. It's it's, it's led actually by a group of Masons as, uh, uh, and the founding fathers of the United States. So we would, and then this is ironic because we're talking about the, this is uh, the day after July the fourth. Uh, they were Masons, so a lot of what was done and how it was done was done according to Masonic rite, uh, Masonic rituals. So. And there it is when they when they created Washington D.C. because they were Masonic, and this was sort of a, a Masonic uh, coup, if you will. It was it was it was a birthing of a new nation under a new god, uh, basically under, under Masonic. So you had a further uh, you had the Puritans breaking away from uh, the Protestants, right? Because the Anglican Church uh, broke away from the Catholics. So you get to 17, 1776 and. Uh, by that time, the Puritans were well away from the, uh, the English Church and uh, and, the, and their former Protestants, uh, their former Protestants, and which is the Anglican Church. And then you had um, uh, the Masonic origins coming out uh, more on that time in the, in the later something with their own thing, and they they're, they're the ones who formed the uh, uh, the revolution. And ironically enough, if you go back into history, if you do follow the right channels. You can actually trace uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin back to uh, and into the Cromwell uh, Revolution, uh, and you can see how they uh, how he connects to the overthrow of the king. And what happens in America is a sort of a continu is a continuation of the whole Cromwell events uh, in history, and this is why it often points back to uh, the Magna Carta. Uh, as the origins for the United States is because it was the sort of contention between the the, the, the throne and the peoples of England, and particularly the nobles, uh, who wanted more freedoms. 
because uh, the British monarchy was not the same as the European monarchy. Uh, the, uh, under Britain, the people had a, lot more, a little more leeway to do things. There, there was more of a sort of... Uh, uh, I call it, uh, the, 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 the king had a sort of a seek uh, public approval before they could before they can go out and do something. In other words, they had to develop and not necessarily approval, but more of a consensus. Uh, and, and so this is what the whole what the whole thing here is. They had to develop this consensus. And so ba basically, uh, up until about the uh, about eighteen hundred, this is what was going on. And this is out of the eighteen hundreds that you begin to start seeing some of the roots. Of uh, socialism begin to emerge, right? So you've, you've you've had this sort of distance between 1600 and 1700, right? So 1600, prior to 1600, is the papacy, primarily a Roman, Roman Catholic period. The Roman Catholic period begins to collapse around 1700, and by 1800, the, the Roman Catholic period has kind of more or less disappeared because you now have the British Empire popping up, and it sort of dominates the globe, and it's a Protestant empire. It's not a um, a, a Roman Catholic Empire, and you start. You, you can go into the history there to see how things switch over from from Catholic to Protestant, and you can sort of see the battles that go on back and forth. Well, out of this environment, this is where you get uh, social socialism comes out of this environment into the 1800s, and you have a whole mix of so-called intellectualism uh, coming in around that period. Uh, and this is where universities start to change from this, basically uh, schools of theology into proper universities where they are academically oriented and, not, and, and intellectually oriented rather than being uh, theologically oriented. And the thing is, is that none of the people who developed socialism actually were poor. They were part of the aristocracy. They were part of the intelligence that, of, that, of that time. They were part of that, the intelligentsia. And so they weren't poor people. They were trying to understand poverty. They were trying to sort of figure out how to eliminate poverty. And so out of this sort of, uh, you know, uh, you could call it mind works, of the 1800 comes your uh, socialism. And a lot of the terms within socialism, a lot of the things that go on today in socialism, come from back there, from back then. And there is a whole history of socialism that is not understood, it's not brought out today, uh, at all in our discussions. And so, if you wonder why socialism fails, all you have to do is go back into its history and then you begin to understand this. And this is where we'll actually going to be working on it, working on a new series that will sort of introduce the history of socialism and go into some of the details of why socialism actually failed. So, anyways, uh, I will. this is it for this uh, episode. I will see you in the next episode. Uh, we'll be back out here more often than not uh, on the patio, unless, of course, we're doing our peripatetics. And in that case, we'll be walking. So, anyways, uh, that's it for now. I'm going to go out and do some more uh, obs observation, cloud observations, and uh, I will see you tomorrow night. Democratic Earth. Earth.